going way back to the beginning, very first chapter. And again, I feel the, the Lord has some things to say to us today. Um, I'm just going to read two verses, beginning in verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. He's obviously talking here about the sun and the moon. And let them, the sun and the moon, be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. It's interesting to me, and, and we, we have to acknowledge this because it's, it's part of the Genesis record, but I do want to remind the church that the sun and the moon and how it interacts with our planet in our particular time of creation with mankind is it was given for signs, seasons, and to also help us regulate and measure time. Okay. And we know that it's, it's for seasons. We, we understand that modern science. We got that down. We know now how the sun and the moon and the rotations all affect our seasons and our fall, winter, spring and, and, and tides of the oceans. and all. I mean, it's amazing how in tune this planet is to what's going on in our solar system. All that's by creational order. But sometimes we forget that there is another. That's the routine stuff. But there are non-routine purposes of the sun and the moon also that are occasionally given for signs. Uh, what's a sign for? Well, the signs are real helpful when you're on a journey. Signs will let you know how close you are to your destination. Signs will let you know as you're getting closer. Signs will also give you a warning when it's time to make a turn toward your destination. So, now not, every, not everything that's routine is a sign. Okay, so, so the signs are occasional, but the, but the other purposes are routine. But nevertheless, all of it goes into something that God designed. I want to preach this morning about rare cosmic events. Rare cosmic events. And I do feel that this will be helpful. I know if you're paying any attention to the news, there's been so much discussion. You'll have discussion this week around the water fountain, etc. And I want to give you some biblical perspective to be able to communicate with a lost world. Can you say amen? Let's pray. In Jesus' name, Lord, we love you. We thank you for this moment that we have gathered into your house on this beautiful Sunday morning. And I'm asking you to let your word go forth by the authority of Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Three or four folks, greet them around you as you're seated in Jesus' name. Now, I know in Wednesday night Bible studies, we've covered some of this stuff the last couple of years pretty thoroughly. But in the ancient days, I want to remind you this morning that Moses' writing, which was the writer, he was the writer of the book of Genesis, it was stunningly different than all the other writings and concepts of his day when it came to where we came from and how the earth got here. The Egyptians and the pagans had all kinds of unbelievable kind of myths of origin. Crazy stuff when you look back on it now and you, you have to laugh and you think, how could have anybody have, have believed that? But, and, and none of those things, and I mean none of those writings and those concepts, came anywhere close to being scientifically accurate. Nothing came as close to modern knowledge as what Moses wrote in the book of Genesis. Nothing else has been confirmed. No other concept has been confirmed so greater. 
God in the ancient days had testified to both Job and Moses as to how earth got here and how humanity came about. And, and he started first with Job, but he talked later to Moses in more detail. And, and, and the book of Genesis was ultimately birthed out of his visitations on the mountain with God for days at a time. God shared with him and this is the record. I want it written. God did not, and you need to understand some. The, the, the Bible is not a science book. It was not written as a science book. It is not an explanation of, of how things uh, work as much as it is an explanation of why things work. And God could not have given the ancient men science books because they didn't have any way to understand it at that time. We understand things today with our technology, but I would tell you that our technologies and so forth are confirming the Word of God over and over again. And so in the book of Genesis, God basically said, I did it, and here's why I did it. <laughs> didn't, ex didn't always tell us exactly how. He just, I, I hung the sun, the moon, and this now. Okay, it, it wasn't a scientific explanation of how he did it. Uh, he was wanting to get across to us why he did it. And the Bible speaks much about signs of cosmic events. As a matter of fact, if you study any prophecy book or prophecy chart, one of the things that is always listed as things that are going to be happening in the last days uh, is there would be cosmic disturbances. It's constantly noted that among theology professors and so forth, and that the fact that these disturbances uh, will, will uncannily match earthly events. Now again, this is not surprising because God said in the beginning uh, that he allowed the moon and the sun to operate and interact with earth in such a way that it would not only be for seasons, which are routine, uh, but it would be for occasional signs uh, and that would be the unusual times. In other words, there would be unusual moments throughout mankind's history uh, when the moon and the stars would, or the moon and the sun, excuse me, would, would, uh, would reference things and, 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 and kind of add a, uh, an explanation point to some things. Mo the moon, matter of fact, all throughout scripture often referenced to things concerning Israel. And then oftentimes the word of God noted that the sun and things that interacted with the sun often interacted with things concerning the Gentiles. And obviously, if you've been paying any attention whatsoever, and if you have not heard about this, I can't even imagine what hole you're living in. <laughs> you must be an amazing neighborhood <laughs> to not know that tomorrow, April 8th, is a biggie. <laughs> it has captured the attention of the media, and by the way, things, things usually do that are in heaven. They make us look up. <laughs> they require us to look up. And it gets all of us looking up at the same time. And you can't look up, by the way, and not be mesmerized to some degree at the, and be in awe at the amazing thing of creation. And these, these occasional events serve as signs uh, that help us to remember. Now, it's not that, and here's the, here's the amazing thing about cosmic events. Uh, when God chooses to use them as signs, uh, it is not because he does something to change the cosmos, uh, he, it, but he has allowed the cosmos uh, to be the, the thing that he uses as his own time clock. In other words, when he set it into order, it flows with incredible precision. And that precision is what allows us uh, to be able to learn and figure out what's going to happen tomorrow. And, what, and we can even track it backwards. We have software now that can track it backwards uh, because creation is so perfect in its timing uh, that goes backwards. And we can tell what cosmic events happened and when. Matter of fact, we've tracked over 8,000, there's either eight or 12,000 eclipses since the beginning of, of, of man. 
We, we know them. We, we, it's not a guesswork. We, 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 we have a way to do it. As a matter of fact, the, the eclipses happen. You know, tomorrow is a, a big lunar eclipse, uh, and, and it's a rare thing that happens, but yet it's routine. You know. But there are certain things about it that's really rare. You know, that only happens like every so often. Now, one thing that is routine is that when the, when the sun and the moon and the stars get into alignment, that actually happens in what they call a synoptic or, or a synodic, excuse me, month, uh, and it, it and it happens every 28 days, 12 hours, 14 minutes, and 2.9 seconds. That's how precision it is. Every 28 days, 12 hours, 14 minutes, and 2.9 seconds, is, is the the moon is rotated around the Earth. The Earth comes around and is in alignment with the sun. Now the thing is, we don't always see eclipses due to it because of the tilted nature of the Earth. And so there's times every every 30 days, roughly 29 days, uh, we have the alignments coming, but they are, they're not rare alignments. Those are the routine ones. But what's going to happen tomorrow is a, is a is a is a rarity. It's one of those 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 seldom times when the when the sun and the moon and the earth are all perfectly aligned and on the same tilt, so that we can see it with the visible eye, and it's totally visible as a totality. And the next time, by the way, that this will happen is not until April of 2078. So while we are seeing tomorrow a routine thing, we are also seeing a rare thing. And that's what I'm trying to get across to us. Some, some have just dismissed this, ah, you know, it's just the same old, same old. Well, and you know, there's, there's a portion of that that's true. I, I do want to remind you, though, that the Bible says in the last days, the mantra of the mockers is going to be, uh, since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. And the, the, the amazing thing that makes certain occasions a sign from God is, is not because they're out of the routine, it's because he times his own work to certain things that he knows is going to take place. And it's, it's, it's for the purpose of communicating with mankind as a sign. Because that was one of the purposes of the sun and the moon in creation. And so... There are events that serve as signs. They help us to remember things. We, we remember covenants such as was made to Abraham. We remember covenants such as made with Noah. And that's one of the reasons for the rainbow. God said, I'll put a bow in the sky every time that you see it. Now, rainbows are relatively routine, but, but they're a sign in the heavens that's just to remind us of some things. That we're not here just alone. We're not here. So we understand much of, of, of the rotations all is routine, but yet timing is what, the timing of certain things is what makes them rare and what makes them sometimes move from routine into being a possible sign in the heavens. Uh, our local news here, just right down the street, a few miles from us, CBN here did a clip. Go ahead and show the clip. be a spectacle like no other. We're all in. Yeah, should be a great day. And right now, it's all the buzz. We're going to make a day of it. Maybe the weekend. Eclipse mania is sweeping the nation. It's pretty dramatic. Yeah. This is a very uh, unique event because the moon, by a strange coincidence, happens to be exactly the same apparent size in our sky as the sun. Of course, the moon's much smaller than the sun, but it's also a lot closer, and it's just at precisely the right distance that it blocks out the sun while leaving the area immediately around the sun, which means that we get to see the solar atmosphere called the corona. Five major U.S. cities will be in the path of totality. That's the 115-mile-wide track falling under the moon's central shadow. Not only, of course, does it get dark because the body of the sun is no longer visible uh, and even noticeably colder, but we have this remarkable display. And uh, it's often said that animals like birds will be fooled into thinking that night has fallen quite quickly. The roughly four-minute spectacle has had some state leaders preparing for months. We're expecting about a million extra people from that Thursday night, the 4th, through uh, Tuesday, the 9th. As a result, many schools in Arkansas and other states are canceling classes. 
Texas officials are even warning residents to top off their gas tank and stock up on food. In Ohio, the governor signed an executive order to increase staffing for emergency management. They're all treating the April late eclipse like a major travel holiday. Any way you cut it, the interstates and highways are going to be crowded. More than 31 million people will be in the path of totality when the eclipse passes over North America. As exciting as it is for us today, eclipses took on a much different tone in ancient times. The ancient people saw celestial phenomenon as omens. Using a dating system that intersects NASA data with the ancient Assyrian calendar, associates for Bible research say it shows an eclipse passed over Nineveh in mid-8th century B.C. That event was preceded and followed by a series of natural disasters. And lo and behold, what does the Bible show us? Immediately after this, a renegade prophet named Jonah shows up and he's preaching repentance at a time when they would be open to it that normally they wouldn't because of the omen. Stripling says the same dating method shows a celestial spectacle happening in 33 AD on April the 3rd. Approximately the same time, the Gospels record the earth turning dark the day of Jesus' crucifixion. Picture this. As the stone is, is rolling to, to seal the tomb, on the horizon, the moon is beginning to appear, and guess what? It's a lunar eclipse. Listen, ancient people would have, would have been powerfully impacted by this. However you feel the impact from this event, countless people worldwide will have an eye to the sky April 8 to see something that has been drawing awe since time began. I've got to get some glasses. I don't know where to get them. Paul Petit, CBN News. Any day's a good day to get those glasses with a sermon of repentance, Gordon. Yes, it is. But the, the, the moon and the sun are signs, and you can read that in the Bible. It's in chapter 1 of the first book, Genesis, and it's verse 14 that these things are signs for us and, and signs for years and for days and for months and for seasons. There's also the sign of uh, when, the, when the sun no longer gives forth its light and the moon no longer gives forth its light. Uh, that's a sign that Jesus says we should look to the heavens for our redemption draweth nigh. I've been in the path of totality. It, it was Long ago, I was just a child and we were living on a farm and uh, all nature just went crazy when, when the sun no longer shone. It was amazing how the animals reacted. The birds and the, all the, the farm animals just were uh, stunned that this was going on and they went into a panic. So if, if you're in the path of totality, look around you as, as it's happening and just see how nature responds to it. Realize, though, that the moon is a sign, the sun is a sign, the days are a sign, and in that, the day draweth nigh for our redemption. We're really not being nutty. We have Bible for this. All throughout history, there were major biblical events that took place on the, at the times of these rare eclipses. And as it was said in the, in the video, it's really true, the ancient world, it, this really impacted them because they, they, they did not have any way of being able to predict when the next eclipse would come. <clears throat> and it's possible they didn't even fully understand even what was happening. All they know is in the middle of the day, it starts getting dark. <laughs> and they could not predict it, but the thing is, God predicts them. And God's time, what I want you to see, <clears throat> what turns the routine into a sign from the Lord is when he chooses to time certain events of his uh, and align them up with heavenly cosmic events that he's already placed into order. That's what turns the routine into the unusual. And, and I, I think it's important that we understand 
that that's why Jesus said, no man knoweth the time or the hour. God holds all of that in his own hands. He's the only one that knows uh, which one of these times he's going to use. When, when is he going to use the routine as something that is not routine? Matthew 27 on screen, it was already noted in the video there. From the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land uh, until the ninth hour. There was a three-hour cosmic event that took place uh, in Jerusalem on the day that Jesus was crucified. I would tell you that there was not an eclipse because Jesus was crucified. Jesus was crucified because God planned it on the day of an eclipse. That's that is what I'm once that's what makes the that's what turns the routine into into a sign. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lama Sapkathani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And here's the thing: the major lunar eclipse was not the only sign. Skip to verse 50. Jesus, when he'd cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Uh, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Uh, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. So we had an eclipse going on. We had an earthquake going on. Uh, we had the veil of the temple that was uh, several inches thick that no man could tear with his own hands. Uh, God ripped it from the top to the bottom. And, and if that wasn't enough, God says, let me give you another sign. Graves were opened. <laughs> and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. This was known by the Apostle Paul as the first fruits of the, of the great resurrection. Uh, and, 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 they said and they went into the holy city and appeared unto many. You can't just dismiss this. <laughs> you say, oh, you're being mystical. <laughs> no, I'm being realistic. This was not a normal day in Jerusalem. Eclipses are happening, earthquakes are happening, uh, things are happening in the church. Veils are being ripped in the church. And, and, and newness of life is coming back. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly saying truly this was the Son of God. What they woke up that morning thinking was just another routine day turned out it was not a routine day. What it was was a special day where God of the heavens was changing his posture toward mankind. That's what makes something a sign. And again, it had a great impact on the ancient world even more than our time because, again, we tend to see them more routinely because our understanding of scientifically of how they work. But again, that's just, a, that's just us understanding creation. And the book of Revelation notes that, that there will be cosmic events that are going to unfold, really unfold, during the time of, the, uh, of Daniel's 70th week, uh, he said there will be signs in the, and one of them will be in the sun and the moon. Uh, they're, they're, uh, remember, their purposes have to do with Israel and the Gentiles. Uh, and Jesus himself noted, uh, bring up Luke 21, he was talking about Daniel's 70th week, which I think we're getting close to. Uh, and he said, there shall be signs in the sun uh, and in the moon and in the stars. And upon the earth there will be distress uh, of nations uh, with purpose perplexity and the sea and the waves roaring and by the way that may not mean the talking about the oceans that might mean sometimes in prophetic lingo when 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 the bible talks about the sea it's talking about a, a crowd a huge crowd of people the masses he said the nations with perplexity and the seas with waves roaring i think that's it's talking about political upheaval Men's hearts will be failing them for fear. And, and here's why. Because they're looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Uh, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Uh, and then, everybody say then. In other words, after those signs, uh, they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power uh, and great glory. Uh, you see, the sign is not the event. Uh, the sign is just getting us ready for the main event. Signs are not what we're looking for. 
What we're looking for is the move and actions of God. But signs just help us to understand when we're getting close. Signs and wonders in the heavens is God's handiwork. And again, most of it is routine. But sometimes, sometimes what we see happening that is routine becomes as if it were the signature of God in the heavens. Matthew 12 There were certain scribes and some Pharisees that came to him and said, Master, we would see a sign from thee. This was rather annoying to Jesus because he'd been doing nothing but signs for the last three years. Been healing the sick, raising the dead, walking on water, cursing fig trees. And yet they come and say, we want to see a sign. Jesus wanted to slap them. Because they were the church. They were the the masters of Israel. They're the ones that should have been understanding what was going on. And they were spiritually blind or stubborn. And verse 39, he said, he answered and said to them, let me tell you something. He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeking after a sign. But there shall no sign be given it. I, I, would, I would say maybe in modern English we would say it this way. I think Jesus was saying, There's no, I'm not going to give you any more signs. I've given you plenty of signs leading up. You should be, but I will give you this. But, everybody say but. The sign of the prophet Jonas. I'm going to give you one last sign that's going to, that's going to put all of this in perspective. Everything you've watched for the last three years is going to come in perspective. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights uh, in the heart of the earth. Uh, And the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it uh, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. He was rebuking his generation of church leaders of Israel. And he said, you have a lack of faith and you're stubborn and you're blind. And Jonas, in Jonas' day, they, they, he preached and they repented. And I'm giving you the similar signs. But you're stubborn. Yet another group, Matthew 16, some other Pharisees, now with some Sadducees, came along, different group. They were tempting him, desired him that he should show them a sign from heaven. Listen to what Jesus said again. Again, he answered and said, when, is it e- when it's evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather today, uh, for the sky is red and lowering. That means, that means, that's an old English word. It means gloomy. He said, in other words, you guys look up in the heavens and you judge the weather. Based on what you're seeing, he said, but you're hypocrites because you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, or could I say another sign, but there shall be no more signs given unto it except, he added again, the sign of the prophet Jonah, and he left them and departed. Now, that's famous story of Jonah and Nineveh needs revisited because Jesus himself referenced the importance of it two times at least. And he said that the last sign that he was going to give his generation was the same way that it came to Jonah's generation. And, he, and, and now the specific sign that Jesus was referring to was that, he was, that Jonah spent three days in the belly of a fish. He said, well, it was a whale. Well... That's what the King James writers in the 15th century uh, translated it as. But the Bible just says it was a great fish. And so we would automatically think whale. We'll get into that in a minute. But, but the thing is, he, he spent three days in the fish. And then when he got out, he preached repentance to Nineveh. And Nineveh repented. Jesus said, there's a greater than Jonah is in your generation. And I'm going to spend three days in the belly of the earth. And I would tell you this, when he comes out of that earth, uh, it was time for Jerusalem to do the same thing that Nineveh did. Uh, It's time to repent. Whatever God sends signs, uh, he's telling mankind, it's time uh, to repent. (laughs) Now God told Jonah to warn this wicked city of Nineveh. 
Nineveh was the Assyrian capital. It's in northern Iraq uh, in, in our modern times. Uh, and that was the sign of Jonah's preaching. It, it was the three days. But, but, but I have to ask myself, but was there another sign that took place as well? God often uses signs that appear to be power over nature to confirm certain truths that he wants to highlight at any given time. He sent fire down from heaven, for example. He sent water from a rock, for example. He, he, uh, there, there's, there's all kinds of events uh, that took place uh, uh, during history. And, and Jesus' three-day event was preceded by a major solar eclipse. Uh, and the Bible hints about this, uh, even though scientifically we've proved it has happened, but the Bible hinted at it while something happened, uh, evidently while or about the time that Jonah was in the fish. You getting interested yet? <laughs> Hold on, I'm fixing something here. Some of you are chilly and I'm trying to help you. <laughs> so God sends events that happen. Turn with me, bring up Jonah chapter 3. He says to Jonah, arise and go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And by the way, that word great there in Hebrew, it meant great in many senses. And the reality about Nineveh, it was a great city that was great in insolence and it was great in wickedness. It was a very wicked place. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey... And he cried. Now this is after the, the whale experience. And he, he went through Nineveh. Now, now again, picture this. He's just walking through Nineveh and he's just proclaiming loud, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now I can tell you what I think would happen if I just walked down through downtown Norfolk Yet 40 days and Norfolk shall be overthrown. You see, we tend to ignore street preaching. There's a few people we get, think it's cute, you know. Maybe a news reporter might even come out and mock a little bit. But I don't suspect that Norfolk will repent just because I'm walking down the street saying it's time to repent. But in verse 5, the Bible said, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth with the greatest of them, even to the least of them. It even included the king. And all Jonah did was walk through town saying, Yet 40 days. And I am thinking that Jonah himself, uh, it's one of the reasons he became so stunned by their repentance. If you remember when you read Jonah's story, he gets depressed later on because, because they repented and God saved them. <laughs> he was so irritated in Nineveh, he wanted to see God destroy him. And by the way, I think we as the people of God need to be careful about that in our time too because because there's no question this world we're living in deserves some judgment. Our nation deserves uh, some judgment. Uh, but that's decisions that are in God's hands. They're not in our hands. And, 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 and we, need to, we need to be reconcilers to the best we can and be warners of things. But, but Jonah was struggling. And I'm thinking that one of the reasons why is that I don't know that Jonah understood why did they actually believe me. In history, it was known as the Bursagal Eclipse. There was a tablet that was found in the 19th century that actually told the story of the history of, the, of, the, of an eclipse that happened in connection with, with Nineveh and Jonah and all this. So it's not only been historically written about, but archaeologists and a scholar, David Wiseman, proved that the eclipse took place over the Assyrian capital of Nineveh, which in our modern day was in northern Iraq, and it happened on June 15th, 763 B.C. 
which the Bible correlates it directly with the time of Jonah's preaching under the king that was in power at that time. Now, the Bible didn't mention specifically about the eclipse. It just mentions what happened in reference uh, to Jonah. But as it was noted before by many, ancient people were very moved uh, by these eclipses and disturbances because they, they were so rare to them. They didn't understand them. Uh, and God used those moments to attach spiritual things uh, to his routine things uh, in order to get a message across to humanity. Uh, and the eclipse had so rattled them uh, and prepared them for Jonah, I'm thinking it happened while he was in the fish because uh, he didn't seem to know anything about it. And so he walks in, the, in, in there and a message was 40 days. You've got 40 days to respond to God. Nineveh shall be overthrown. Uh, if you look at that phrase in the Assyrian language, uh, what he was actually saying in the Assyrian language uh, is yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be made to repent. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be made to repent. It's the English transversion we read in the King James. It's slightly different. Which brings us to, to the issue with what got Jonah there to begin with. Uh, and it's the whole fish story. I, I've had people ask me through the year, Pastor, do you really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a, by a whale? And, and, and again, I want to remind you, the only reason that the word whale was used because the King James writers translated whale because any great fish, we think, yeah, it had to be a whale. Well, maybe, maybe not. Bring up slide two. One of the issues is that whales were not prevalent in the Mediterranean Sea. But there is this critter known as a basking shark. It's the second largest fish behind whales on planet Earth. And the interesting thing about this breed is that they live in the Mediterranean. And guess what? They only eat plankton. Did you catch that? Th these fish are not designed to eat like, like sharks where they kill and eat blood. And not, that not, he only eats plankton. And, and, and could, could, could a whale, you know, could a fish this big, just a little bigger than a whale, could that, could that swallow a small guy named it? Yeah, it, it can happen. It, it, and, and, and would I say that's a miracle that he survived? Yes, it, it is. It is a miracle. The story of Jonah is a miracle. But let me tell you something. The story of Jonah's fish is not where the big miracle is. The much bigger miracle is that Nineveh repented. I mean, they repented in mass. That was a greater miracle than what God did saving Jonah. And the reason all this hubbub's going on in the news is because tomorrow on April 8th uh, is called the Great American Eclipse. Because this particular rare lunar event is, is centered over North America specifically. It's going to touch a little bit of Mexico. It's going to touch a little bit of Canada. But for the most part, it is an American event. Bring up slide three. We see things in the Bible that is called a Shemitah in Hebrew. It means a seven-year cycle of shaking. Seven years ago, in August of 2017, August 21st of 2017, there was another notable total eclipse that took place. It's a rarity for them to happen this close together. But seven years ago, there was one that started up in the corner of the great Northwest in Salem, Oregon, and it traveled all the way across North America out through South Carolina into the ocean. Now, seven years later is the one that's going to happen tomorrow, April 8th, 2014, or 2024, excuse me. And the lines are thick because they're showing what is known as the the, the line of totality, where it will be able to see it totally eclipsed. You'll be able to see it outside of the line of totality, but you won't be able to see the total eclipse unless it's in this, some say, 115-mile range. Other, most that I've been reading are 200-mile are radius. So they're saying this 200-mile swath was what happened in, in 17 is what's going to happen tomorrow, only it's happening in the exact opposite direction. And the fascinating thing <clears throat> about the one seven years ago was that again it was an american eclipse uh, and it came across seven cities that were named salem 
it started, and remember Salem's interesting because that was the original name of Jerusalem before God turned it into Jerusalem. And, the, and, and so it, it started in Salem, Oregon. It went across Salem, Idaho, Salem, Wyoming, Salem, Nebraska, Salem, Missouri, Salem, Kentucky, through Salem, South Carolina, and went out seven. It's known as the Seven Salem's Eclipse. Now, interestingly, about tomorrow, it's also crossing a lot of major cities and smaller cities, but people that have been paying biblical attention picked up on something. And if you use a 200-mile wide totality from Texas through Nova Scotia, it is going to cross over at least six townships and towns, hamlets in some cases, that are known in America as Nineveh. Now who knew that there were six places named Nineveh in America? I had no idea. And, and, and the first one is going to cross in Nineveh, Texas. Now some are saying it's seven, but I, I don't think that. There's actually a place in, in Virginia called Nineveh. Virginia is not in the line of totality. I, I think that's an error. I'm seeing at least six when I look this up. And so it's going to come in Nineveh, Texas, it's going to cross Nineveh, Indiana, Nineveh, Ohio. By the way, while it swings through, that's near Cincinnati. Guess, guess what's also right near, will be in the line of totality? It's the Ark Encounter. <laughs> Full-size replica of Noah's Ark will be in the line of totality. And through Nineveh, Pennsylvania, Nineveh, New York, and the last Nineveh it's going to hit is it gets out of North America is Nineveh, Nova Scotia. And what's going to take place tomorrow is expected to be the most viewed astrological event in history. They're stirred up about this. Now, I got to tell you, eclipses are not generally exciting. It's like watching hair grow. And all these people that are driving and spending money and staying in hotels and, 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 climbing, and I'm thinking to myself, I, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't, I mean, it would be neat if I was in the line, I'd, I'd be checking it out. But I ain't driving all the way to the Midwest to see this. I just catch it on YouTube later. <laughs> Y'all have at it. Because it's, it's not really dynamic, you know, but it is attention getting. And it's attention grabbing. And no, I don't think that, that tomorrow any big production is going to I think it's going to come and go as smooth as they always do. Uh, that's not the point. What makes it a sign is not the, the routineness. It's what God happens to be doing in reference to it. Even the animals are going to get confused and think, what in the world is going on? Because they work on the, those circadian rhythms also. And, and, and again, it's the, the sun and the moon are for signs and for seasons. God, for whatever reason, you cannot, uh, you cannot escape the reality that in a seven-year Shemite period, uh, God is drawing a massive X over America. So the question is, if this is a sign, what does it mean? It is certainly a rarity that's never happened. So you get to the crux of the matter. The crux is where the X marks the spot. Look on the map and see where the X, where both lines cross. There is one place in southern Illinois that is going to have both totalities cross them. Now, let me show you how rare this is. If you were to stand in one place on planet Earth for 360 years, and if you lived for 360 years, you would see one total lunar eclipse in your lifetime. But the math got broken when it comes to a little place called Carbondale, Illinois. Because in southern Illinois, in Carbondale, there's a, that town is also known as, uh, you ready for this? This is true. Little Egypt. That whole county there has a bunch of towns named after Egyptian places. Now there's a story behind it, and I don't, I don't even remember it right offhand, and I don't have time anyway. But the point that I think is interesting uh, is that there's an X being placed over America, 
We have seven cities through Salem, six times through sounds of Nineveh, and it, and it crosses uh, at Little Egypt. Now, an X in the Hebrew letter is the Aleph Tav, uh, and, it, and in the Greek, it also is a letter, and both of them uh, have the same similar meaning. Uh, it means Alpha and Omega. That's why this particular sign is known as the signature of God. That's why, that's why people that, you know, sometimes if they don't know how to write, they just put an X on their thing. What in the world? Well, where that came from was that, that, that the X is considered the signature of God. It's probably what Elon Musk had in mind when he renamed Twitter. And it means, in both languages, Hebrew and Greek, it means the, the pretty much the same thing. It means the beginning and the end. Now the question is, if this is not just the routine, and if this happens to be one of the signs, what does it mean? Can God be saying to America... Now, the, 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 the signature, by the way, that X can mean warning of destruction, or it can also mean a, a sign of completion. In other words, it can be a positive thing, or it could be a very, very negative thing. Now, after the Salem eclipses, it's interesting to note what's happened in the last seven years. It ushered in that next year the worst hurricane season in American history. Hurricane Harvey alone was over $160 billion worth of losses. There have been so many natural disaster losses across America that insurance companies are starting to get into financial trouble. Do you know that right now we are in a situation right now where our insurance company will not insure a, a certain roofs? We, our Hampton building, our shed, our, our children's center, we put new roofs on them to, to match insurance records. Now they won't even cover that. He said, because it's either that or, we're, or we're, 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 we're pulling out of there. We've had too many losses. There's too much. Again, we've been acting like it's just a normal day. It's not been a normal day. The last seven years uh, have been constant upheaval. The COVID pandemic hit. Oh man, what upheaval. The BLM riots, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, churches and religion in America have gone nuts. And we are being led by incredibly stupid and or wicked people. And sometimes it's stupid and wicked, which is the worst combination. And we have no doubt let in many terrorists into our borders over the last year. And, there, and there's political upheaval and, and strain and stress and, and, and all of this is going on. All of this has unfolded in the last seven years. Then last fall, Hamas attacked Israel. And what you may not know is that they have admitted that the reason that they attacked Israel was because later, earlier in that fall, there was the delivery, ironically, from Texas of five red heifers that were delivered to Israel that has finally, the in Israeli uh, Temple Mount has announced that they have finally have five red heifers uh, that meet the biblical qualifications for sacrifice. And they have to be perfect. There's a whole litany of things. We've taught on this before. And they, they have to do it. But, and they have them. That's the point. They have them now. And they have to be. They can only be sacrificed in the third year of their life. They just transferred these five cows to Israel. Because guess what? They have hit the three year mark. And they have to be sacrificed this year. And the Israelites are ready to do it. And the issue is it needs to happen on, on, on the mount where, where the Dome of the Rock is. But now they're saying that there's another possibility that they may take them down to Shiloh, which was the original place of the, of the tabernacle before it was moved to Jerusalem. Uh, they, the, the priests are saying we can do it in Shiloh or we can do it in Jerusalem. But they are saying that the sacrifice of these animals uh, are imminent. Some were predicting it to happen at the Passover last week. I'm assuming that it hasn't happened because I haven't heard about it. 
Because it'll be nice, it'll be big news when it happens. And you say, well, what's it mean? It doesn't mean anything to us. It's what it means to Israel. Israel is God's time clock, uh, and Israel is ready to sacrifice. Uh, they're saying it's eminent, it's got to be done this year. And once the red heifer is sacrificed, uh, it means any time after that sacrifice begins, uh, Israel says we are ready to build uh, the third temple. And all of this we know is stuff that's unfolding for Daniel's 70th week. Uh, and devout Jews are expecting Messiah to come. Uh, and the irony is, is the Muslims are expecting their Messiah to come uh, as well. It's why Iran is rising up. Uh, and just this week they approved phase two of the war. Uh, that's why they're gonna, you're going to see Israel is going to become attacked in the northern border. Israel is getting ready to respond. They're, they're preparing now to enter into Lebanon. Uh, they're even talking chatter that they may be ready to enter into Iran itself. Uh, I can't imagine what kind of upheaval is getting ready. Remember on New Year's Eve when I made the comment uh, and I said, God spoke to me this year is going to be a year of intensified conflict. Uh, there, there's the, I, I think we're getting ready to see something that's going to be amazing over in the Middle East. Uh, and, and it might be. I not, don't know that it is, but it could be the thing that leads us even into Daniel's 70th week but the point is, is, is I'm not trying to predict it that, that, that carefully I'm just trying to say Israel's preparing for war and right now America which is really the, the biggest buffer between Israel and, and the whole Arab world uh, is the strongest nation in the world is being led by the weakest leader that we've ever had in our history Mr. Biden's so out of it, he don't know his head from a hole in the ground. And the Muslims want final war. Intelligence chatter just announced this week that it's noting that they are even talking about being willing to sacrifice the Dome of the Rock if it'll bring about the war that will destroy Israel. The Middle East is becoming a tender, tender box, and America is going in circles right now with weak leadership and so I, I, I'm seeing amazing things that are unfolding now the question is is God using this eclipse to warn America here's what's interesting to me when you saw major biblical events take place in history it was often more than just one sign there were several things even Jesus crucified several things when God changed his posture toward a particular people he allowed it to be shown by several things uh, and I'm, it's amazing to me to note that the same week or within a couple of weeks uh, of, of having this major major rare solar event uh, we had this bizarre thing that happened up in the up, up the, the Chesapeake this past week when, when this ship, you saw the video, it just turned right into that pillar and the Francis Scott Key Bridge just collapsed like a cheap suit. It was stunning. But what's stunning is Francis Scott Key, the bridge was named after the man who wrote the National Anthem of America. And the question that comes to those that, that watch things in the spirit, uh, was this a sign that's telling us America's about to collapse? I, I hope not. I pray what it's a sign of is that this Biden administration will collapse. I do pray that. But is it possible that it's one of the signs that's leading with the eclipse uh, along with this bridge? Again, it's national news stuff. Uh, it's stuff that everybody's talking about. Uh, and then, and then this week, on top of all that, New York City has an earthquake. Another rare event. Bring up slide four. And on top of all of that, uh, lightning this week strikes the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> oh, it's just coincidence. Maybe. But that's some weird coincidences. Or it could be, he that hath an ear, let him hear. The question is, is any of this stuff getting your attention yet? Or are you just going by, busily buying and selling, marrying and giving in marriage? I'm not trying to be mystical. But I am trying to be realistic and biblically sound. I'm trying to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And one thing seems for sure, God is talking. 
And when God chooses to talk and when he changes his posture towards a people, he does it through heavenly signs. He does the preaching through the fivefold. Uh, he sent the eclipse uh, to add to the impact of Jonah's preaching. I believe that God is fixing to do something different in relation to America. That's why this one is called the Great American Eclipse. I am saying that what I feel in the spirit is that what we're about to see is, is this is being announced that God is changing a posture to a different type of action toward the people of America. Proverbs 25 said, It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search out a matter. When Jonah preached to Nineveh that they had 40 days to repent, I believe that God is saying in the spirit to, to the, I, I'm, I really feel in my spirit, this isn't just the routine. This one has the markings of, of, a, of a heavenly sign that, that it's just that America is given a season. We have a season to repent and that's what we must do. And, and I see some positive things, by the way, during this past seven years, as horrible as things have gotten, I've seen a lot of positive things of signs. They're not in the news, but I see signs underneath. I see a rising up. I see a, a, a new conservatism. That rise. I'm seeing a political, I mean, a, a, a patriotic campaign that's moving. We're seeing some people rise up and take over school boards again and start, start trying to push back this darkness. I, I actually see some positive signs. Now, whether or not it's too late, I don't know. But I do believe this. I believe in end time revival. I believe in 11th hour revival. I believe that we are getting ready to see the greatest move of God that the earth has ever seen. Now, if that requires the collapse of America, then, it'll, it'll, then God will say, so be it. I don't know if it does. It may just require an extreme shaking. I don't know. But I do know this. Just for jollies... I pulled out my calendar, and I started tomorrow, April 8th, and I just thought, I wonder what's going to Counted out 40 days. Guess where I ended up? May 18th, interestingly enough, is my spiritual birthday. I will have been baptized in Jesus' name for 49 years on that day. But I doubt that's what God is showing in the heavens. <laughs> I don't think that was the sign of it. Got my attention. <laughs> but it's actually not May 18th. The, the, the 40 days ends on May 18th, the day before Pentecost Sunday. When God changed his action, his posture toward Jerusalem, he gave an eclipse and several signs and then it, none of those things is what changed Jerusalem. It's what Jesus did that changed Jerusalem. It's what he did without allowing a church to be born 40 days later. I want you to know, and I posted this. Some of you that, that, that get our app and stuff, you should have seen this already. But we just gathered this week the numbers we do every year. Easter to Easter, our organization gathers all of our statistics after Easter every year. And, and we, we try to conclude three things. We try to get a number of how many people were in our churches on Easter Sunday, how many people were baptized uh, or filled with the Holy Ghost in the last 12 months uh, or from Easter to Easter. Uh, we just gave a report for the Virginia District for just our fellow. Now, remember, that's just our organization. That's not counting all the other things that God's got going on. Uh, but we had uh, uh, 11,223 people in attendance in our 70 churches that were here in Virginia. That is an all-time record for the Virginia district. Uh, here's this one. Last year we had 1,231 people baptized in Jesus' name in our churches in Virginia. Another record number in the states. Uh, we had 1,056 uh, people filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost just in our church. That's not counting uh, all the other independents and other organizations or whatever God's doing. Uh, all I'm saying is, uh, is that I think that something 40 days from now, from tomorrow, from this sign uh, is Pentecost, just like it was uh, in Jesus' name. 
Now, Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. It wasn't three full days. It was two full days, but the third day in the morning is when it happened. It didn't finish the third day. If a day is with the Lord, is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, and we're seeing signs that's pushing up against Daniel's 70 of the week, what I'm seeing in it all is I'm seeing signs that saying God is fixing to change his posture toward the church. I believe the trumpet's coming before long. But between now and then, it's Pentecost time. I'm just saying it's time for us to get our house in order. I am expecting some of the greatest moves of God to begin uh, this year. Now, I don't know what all is going to happen in the world. We may endure some incredible mess uh, that's coming politically. We may endure it uh, uh, with natural disasters. I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. I'm a bishop. I'm not trying to be a prophet. I, but I am trying to <laughs> see which way the wind's blowing. And I will tell you, I'm stirred in my spirit. Stand with me this morning. I got three more pages of notes. Because I got over-inspired. But I'm out of time. Bring up that last slide. Let me show you one last little interesting thing. The eclipse is going to come in through southern Mexico and it's going to hit America. You know where it hits America at? It's going to first hit America. First place is a little place called Eagle Pass, Texas. What you see on the right is a headline from National Public Radio. It said, the center of the border conflict is Eagle Pass. Shelby Park is the grave of the Confederacy. It's named after a Confederate general. Now we know that the that the war came to a close in Virginia, but not everybody got the memo. (laughs) And it kept brewing for some time after. But they say that the the Confederate general, now remember it was it was a battle about states' rights. But that Confederate general buried the Confederate flag in Eagle Pass, Texas and proclaimed the Confederacy over. It's interesting. Politically, it, it, the Civil War ended in Virginia. Realistically, it ended in Eagle Pass, Texas. And interesting enough, Eagle Pass, Texas is one of the biggest conflict areas of the border crisis that's going on right now between Texas and Mexico. And guess what's going on right now? It's one of the biggest fights we've had since the Civil War over states' rights. Where Texas is saying we have a right to defend ourselves and the national federal government is saying no you don't. And it's fascinating to me that this thing comes in and introduces itself to America at Eagle Pass. I predict something's going to change in policy that you're going to see happen this year concerning this border mess and all that we've let in. I wish that I could have a little crystal ball that I saw it all perfectly. I promise I'd share it with you. but we see through a glass darkly. But as we get closer to things, we start seeing them face to face. I do think this. The question is, are all these things catching our attention? Are we taking note? Jonah proclaimed the gospel to Nineveh, and Nineveh repented. I'm praying And I'm still believing God that this X on America, one way or the other, it seems like it is the heavenly signature of God upon not the rest of the world, but it's how God's posture is about to change toward America. And I only see two postures that God could take. 
He can either take a posture of judgment and destruction, or he can take a, post a posture of restoration and power and revival. Or it's possible that it may be a combination of both. But I know to any saint of God, you've got to have been feeling like I have. I have talked to the Lord some days with all the mess that's been going on these last few years. So grieved in my spirit of seeing what's going on. Seeing churches bringing drag queens in and, and, and all kinds of crazy foolish stuff that we're doing. And, 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 and stupid policies. I, and I think, what in the world is happening? And I have numerous times asked God. God, how long are you going to tolerate this? How long are you going to put up with this? How long until you deal with it, until you break the power of it? I'm feeling like we're about to see something change. And I think that's what this means. Now, what, how all that will unfold, I don't know. But God is either going to bless the American church or he's going to judge the American church. And by the way, tomorrow, when that X crosses Little Egypt, guess what it is in the Hebrew calendar? To us, it's April 8th. Tomorrow is the first day of Nisan in the Hebrew calendar. It's the beginning of the new year of spring. The first of Nisan, those of you that know your Bibles know that the first of Nisan was the day that God delivered Israel out of Egypt. So I'm praying that this is not God signaling judgment. It might be, and maybe it will take some judgment in order to bring about the other but I'm praying that what God is fixing to do is change his position toward America and start breaking the power of some of this chaos and the craziness that start revealing things that have been heavy and start. I, I, I pray that's what it is. Uh, but I know this, it was first in the sun was time to leave Egypt for Israel. I'm praying that tomorrow becomes the day that America starts leaving. There's still a lot of people in this country that love God and love the Bible and love truth. But we've been silenced and we've been marginalized and we've been pushed down and craziness has been leading us. Uh, I'm praying somehow God. Been, and here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open this altar right now and I'm going to ask the church to come and gather with me. And I'm going to ask us to go into a moment of prayer for this nation. I think tomorrow is going to come and go in routine. I'm not expecting any big something or other to happen. What I'm looking for is things that happen after. What's going to happen in the spirit after? I'm going to ask this church to gather and I'm going to ask us to go to prayer for the church. I'm asking you to go to prayer for the churches of America. I'm asking you to go to prayer for the nation of America. Because I'm telling you in the spirit, God is fixing to do something different in America. We'll know it better as we see it, but, but it's changing. There's a posture change coming this year. But I'm going to tell you, in the meantime, when it comes down to our house and for us, uh, it's time to repent. It's time for us to get our house in order. Uh, it's time for us to get ourselves in order. Uh, the signs are just meant to tell us, uh, hey, church, uh, wake up. I don't want to hear him say, could you not pray with me for one hour? Come on, lift your voice. Begin to go into prayer right now. I loose this word upon this assembly by the authority of Jesus' name. I loose this word upon the people of God. In Jesus' name, God, let this word permeate our spirit. Let this word become engrafted in us. Let this word get into our spirit. And I'm asking you, Lord, to begin to stir the hearts of your church. Begin to stir the hearts of your people. God, we repent of our sin. We repent of our laziness. We repent of our lackadaisical nature. God, we must still believe in you for revival in this land. 
God, would you bring revival upon America? God, would you revive the church? Would you break the powers of evil that have gotten into control? Would you help us to destroy the power of these deep states? Powers, corruption that have gotten into power. God, only you can do it. Only you can change it. Only you can save America. Only you can cause this to happen. We have no hope outside of you, God. Come on, church, lift up your voice. Worship under the... Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Begin to intercede in tongues. Halamadi andalolosha. He karala na mashala la la matai. He karala no no moshara tahai yada tahai. Oh halamasha. Come on, church. I feel something happening in here. I feel. I'm asking God to anoint this word with His presence. God, would you allow the gifts of your spirit to operate? Would you allow your power and your anointing to loose your angels among the people of God? Oh, that's it. Come on, that's it. There's something happening in the Holy Ghost. God, let there be an anointing that flows from one side to the other side. Let it flow from the back to the front. Let every soul that is coming to this house feel the anointing that we feel. I'm asking you to go out online to those watching online. In Jesus' name, let the same anointing that's in this house begin to visit upon them where they are. It's time for the gospel to go forth. It's time for the preaching of repentance. It's time for the sign of Jonah to come upon America. Oh, halama. Whatever has to happen, God, to save us. Whatever you got to do, if you got to shake the heavens, but save us. Bring our households into order. Bring our marriages into order. Bring our children into order. We call upon you in repentance today. He's here. He's here.
Let record numbers be filled. Move the church into a new dynamic. I speak it forth in Jesus' name. I proclaim it in Jesus' name. God, show us your hand. Show us your power.
I'm calling this church for the next 40 days. Put away your own agendas. Lead on what I want done. Put your needs behind. I've got your needs. But for the next 40 days, I want the agenda to be about what I want done. Follow your bishop. Follow the words of God that I've put on. I've given direction for this church. Do these things and you'll see great revival. Before we close out, I think it's appropriate to take a moment or two to put some things off and to put some things on. Right now, if you haven't already, we need to take a moment to repent and to put off some mindsets, to put off some selfishness, and to put on some humility, and to put on some 
Christ-mindedness so that we can focus for the task that is at hand. We've got some people from our daughter church in Virginia Beach that are coming. I believe there's one from their service that's going to be baptized. But let's take a moment right now to repent, to prepare our minds, our hearts, our spirits for this next 40 days that the Lord has called us to. Let's put off selfishness. Let's put off any division, divisiveness. Let's clothe ourselves in humility and close ourselves with the mind of God. Let's get renewed in our spirits. Let's get a renewed sensitivity to God's voice and to God's moving. Begin to lift up your voice, saints. Begin to lift up a cry unto God. Begin to call out on his name right now. Lord Jesus, Lord, we humble ourselves before you, God. Wash us over, Jesus. Cleanse our minds, oh God. Cleanse our hearts, our spirits, Lord. We plead the blood of Jesus right now. Lord, we lay aside every bit of selfishness, God. Every bit of selfishness, we set it aside, Jesus. Lord, give us the mind of Christ Jesus. Give us a mind committed to the cause. Give us a mind committed to you and to your mission, Lord Jesus. Clothe us in humility, God. Clothe us in humility, Jesus. Lord, we declare a renewing right now in the Holy Ghost, a renewing of our mind, a renewing of the spirit, a renewing of sensitivity to your voice, a renewing of sensitivity to your leading. Anoint our eyes to see, anoint our ears to hear. Wake us from the slumber, oh God. Wake us from the drowsiness, oh God. Wake us up to the times. Wake us up to what you've called us to. In the name of Jesus, let there be new vision. God let there be new understanding let there be a new realization that you're speaking and that you're moving don't let us take it for granted oh God let us have an appreciation for your word let us have an appreciation for the preaching let us have an appreciation for the gifts of the spirit Mm. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Church, I feel there's a, a gravity this morning, a gravity from the pulpit, from from pre-service prayer, from praise, from worship, from the gifts of the Spirit, from the preaching of the Word. There's a gravity, and there's also like a, a tangible excitement. We got somebody about to get their sins washed away. Praise the Lord. There's an excitement about what's about to happen. Pastor Madej, go ahead. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Thank you, Jesus. Church, there's a, there's a gravity this morning, but I also sense an excitement about what is about to happen in this church, in this community, in this nation, in this world. There's an excitement, almost an electricity in the atmosphere. Does anybody feel that? Uh, 
there's a song that, uh, that used to be on the radio. This was a while back. Me and Brother Brown used to sing it together. But it, it says, Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, please don't do it without me. Lord, if you're blessing, blessing in this season, don't do it without me. Lord, if you're healing, if you're healing in this season, don't do it without me. Lord, if you're speaking, if you're speaking in this season, don't do it without me. It's my hope. It's my hope that we could grab a hold. Listen, if you don't get on the train, the train is going to go right by you. But if we can hop on to what the Lord is doing in this season, there's going to be increased revival. There's going to be increased blessing, healing, miracles, breakthrough, deliverance, Holy Ghost. More sins are going to be washed away. And I'm here to tell you, the train will not slow down for you. You need to get on the train of what the Lord is doing. You need to get on board before it passes you by. And it's my prayer, Lord. Whatever you're doing in this season, God, don't do it without me. If you've got that in your spirit, just declare it right now before God. Whatever. Whatever you're doing, Jesus. Lord, don't do it without me. Whatever you do in Jesus, don't do it without me. Hallelujah. There's another getting prepared to be baptized. Somebody say, don't do it without me. Don't do it without me, Jesus. You know what? We can close in a moment. People are being blessed. People are being healed. Somebody get on the train. Don't do it without me, Jesus. Find somebody to pray for. Find somebody to encourage. Jesus, don't do it without me, God. Don't do it without me. Somebody get the excitement. The train is moving. Don't do it without me.
one baptized in Jesus' name, and there's another getting ready to be baptized in Jesus' name. We've already had one receive the Holy Ghost, and you better watch out, another one or two might get the Holy Ghost. This morning, I dismiss you in Jesus' name. You're free to get your children, get some bread if they haven't. And I also want to say, you're free to praise the Lord for a couple more minutes. Somebody say, don't do it without me. Lord, whatever you're doing, don't do it without me. God bless you. You're dismissed. I'll be ministering this evening. Look forward to seeing you. God bless.